Good afternoon and welcome to A Mighty Blaze. I am your host, Jane Roper. Uh, welcome to The Zeitgeist. Um, quick intro to A Mighty Blaze for those of you who may not be familiar with it. We are a 100% volunteer run uh, organization. Social media platform started at the beginning of the pandemic by authors uh, Jenna Blum and Caroline Levitt to help promote authors and independent bookstores in the pandemic and beyond. Um, so we are broadcasting multiple interview shows with authors every week. Um, to stay up on what we're doing, you can give us a like on Facebook, follow us on Instagram or Twitter. You can also um, go to our website, amightyblaze.com, and uh, sign up for our newsletter, and you'll get the rundown on what's happening every week. Um, if you are a regular uh, Mighty Blaze viewer, follower, whatever, we are actually running a survey right now to help uh, determine how we can be even better in the new year and beyond. And um, I think we will put a link in the chat uh, to that survey and maybe we'll, we can pop it up on the screen as well. And if you've got five minutes, please uh, check out the survey and let us know what you think. We are very appreciative for it. Um, so, my guest today on the Zeitgeist is Yelena Lemberski. She is the author of Like a Drop of Ink in a Downpour. Um, she was born and raised in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. Um, I still call it Leningrad. I always think of it as Leningrad. I guess that's what I get for growing up in the, <laughs> in the 80s. Um, she uh, today lives with her family just north of Boston. Um, in the 80s, she studied art at the Stiglitz Academy. Stig Stiglitz Academy of Art and Design, now known as the Mahina Art College. Um, after emigrating with her mother to the U.S. in 1987, she earned a double Bachelor of Science and Art at the University of Michigan and a Master's of Architecture at MIT. Uh, in the 1990s, Yelena joined the Unitera Foundation, creating Felix, the Felix Limbersky Center for Art and Society, named after her grandfather, a uh, prominent Leningrad artist and nonconformist. Um, her first book, published in 2009, was about him, uh, Felix Lemberski, Paintings and Drawings. It was a comprehensive monograph of his art and life. Uh, and her debut memoir, which we're here to celebrate today, uh, was just published this month and co-authored with her mother, Galina. Uh, in, there it is, yes. And uh, in a wonderful review in the Los Angeles Review of Books, uh, they said, Galena and her daughter, Aliona, which is Yelena's preferred diminutive, uh, have painted a vivid portrait, one of life in and escape from a country that now exists only in memories and memoirs. Their family tenet is that art comes before anything else, and the book serves as a harrowing illustration of the high price such a devotion to art can exact, extract, while also providing hope to sustain the devotion. Yelena, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to have you. It's such a pleasure, Jane. It's such a pleasure to speak with you. And having read two of your books, I just I just admire your voice, both written and uh, your journalism. And, and so many thanks to everybody who creates this opportunity for us to show this our work. Um, it's a difficult time because of COVID. And I just want to tell everybody, uh, I know authors are listening and... Uh, um, it's um, there is there is a lot of hope and there is a lot of um, um, th there is a place for your books out there. I know it takes more time now with the COVID, mm -hmm. but just uh, don't give up. Keep trying. There are lots of wonderful uh, places. I started uh, looking for um, a publisher uh, a month before um, basically be before the shutdown. Mm -hmm. um, and luckily, the small publisher, um, Academic Studies Press, um, gave a place for this memoir. They recently started a uh, new imprint called Cherry Books, uh, Cherry Orchard Books, uh, that is dedicated to memoirs. And um, I've been very lucky to uh, work with this group. Mm. So yeah, it's great. Yes, it's true. I mean the the. Pandemic has made everything harder for authors, but uh, and writers, but but you know there is hope, and it just everything just takes a little bit longer. <laughs> so, um, so Yelena, tell us how did this book come to be? Where what was the genesis of it, and made you decide to write it? Uh, <laughs> it's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I um, 
I wrote uh, my first book um, about my grandfather, the man I uh, never uh, didn't know. Uh, he died when I was one years old, one year old, um, and um, the, the time before I started to form my memories. Mm -hmm. But after long after he started to lose his, mm -hmm. uh, he continued to be uh, a part of our home through his paintings, uh, his um, tools, his brushes were always uh, standing upright in uh, the vase on our TV. Right. Um, but uh, he was um, so in he was a first dissident in our family. Um, the in in Soviet Russia, um, there was only one style uh, of art you could create uh, socialist realism. Mm. And it's a very strange style that is um, that looks real realism, almost photographic. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it is utopia. Right, and he refused to make this art, um, so his paintings could not be exhibited. Right. Um, my mother, uh, when I was eight years old, decided to. Uh, that's my mother. Ah, portrait of your mother. Yeah. <laughs> when she was probably eighteen, <laughs> this is the painting called Babiyar. Uh, right, and I yeah, I should uh, we'll we'll get to that because that's part of one of his more controversial works. So yeah, sorry, go go on. Yeah, um, so he um, so when after he died, um, my mother when I was and uh, when I was eight years old, my mother decided to emigrate. Um, really, with uh, the, the the reason for this decision was to take the paintings out of the country somewhere where she could exhibit. And she has uh, a dream, and she st still does, to create a museum for his paintings. Um, what she didn't realize is that by this very decision to leave the country, by this decision to emigrate, she also became a dissident. Right. And this decision started a chain of events that broke apart our family and um, landed her in prison. Right, right. So yeah this is about that yeah so i mean it what's interesting to me first going back to your your grandfather's art is that even though he wasn't allowed to show his work and it was considered a dissident he was also he was still supported by some sort of like artists it was an artist union or or a trade organization of some sort right so he was sort of considered a working artist and yet one who couldn't show his work that's that's absolutely right. So there was so Soviet Union had uh, a very um, well developed network of support of artists. This is the main way they uh, the country could control artists is mm. they controlled all the museums, uh, the salaries, and all the commissions. You couldn't go outside and sell your work to a private collector. You couldn't exhibit without being a part of this institution, and um, you had to be educated. And there was a path. So everybody outside of that path would just would not even have access to paints and brushes. Mm. Um, so he he started painting in the 30s during avant-garde, um, mm. but then he was educated in this very prestigious and very um, uh, good um, academy of art that started was started by Catherine the Great, mm. um, and so he studied socialist realism. So he studied realism. Mm -hmm. he, studied, he could easily paint. Uh, to fit, uh, you know, with what was required, but by the end of the fifties, but 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 he, um, by the end of the fifties, he moved away from that completely, and he stopped taking commissions and started to work with what he believed was uh, the right thing. So, right, right, okay. yeah, and he uh, a big part of it. Not only did he not um, fall in line in doing this, the realism, but he was also weaving Jewish themes into his work. Um, and I flashed it up before, but this this painting, his painting of Babi Yar, which was uh, area outside of Kiev, where thousands of Ukrainian Jews were executed um, during the Holocaust. Um, and it, it's interesting to me that that you know it's where the sort of um, 
the Nazis were, of course, you know, the enemies to to Russia, to the Soviet Union. And yet at the same time, because of the um, anti-Semitism, um, this wasn't seen as some sort of heroic image. It was it was sort of caught in this place between, OK, well, they're the bad guys, but then they're also the bad guys. So we're, we, this can't be shown at all. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Now, your um, your mother and you were not your your being Jewish wasn't really a part of your identity when you were growing up. Um, and your mother wasn't raised Jewish either. Is that right? No, no, not at all. When we finally emigrated and uh, I was shocked, uh, surprised to see my grandmother in a synagogue following Hebrew text. I had mm -hmm. no idea that she could read uh, Hebrew. Um, and I think so, so both my grandparents, my, our families uh, were raised Jewish and, you know, my grandmother's grandfather was a rabbi, and mm -hmm. uh, but um, there was a very uh, strong anti Semitism right. uh, in Russia. Uh, the, the, the Holocaust was not discussed after the war, right. uh, it was never uh, talked about that Nazi targeted Jews. Um, mm -hmm. And so, my grandfather's painting that you showed, uh, and two others, um, were really. Uh, one of the first and few surviving uh, images of Babi Yar. Mm. Are, um, um, they're historically significant, but mm. he could never, through all these years, could never show them in Russia. Yeah. Even though they were realist, and even though they showed Nazis as an enemy, as you're saying, right. but because it touched on a subject that concerned, they showed Jews with empathy, um, right. they were, these paintings he could never be shown. Yeah, and it's interesting that now in the United States and in the world, these are the best known paintings by him. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and our yeah, so our um, so I think in part to protect us uh, right. during uh, during Stalin and and later, my uh, grandmother never um, taught uh, taught us about our Jewish heritage. Yeah. Um, the only thing we did is we had matzah for Passover. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay good but matzah, matzah is just good anytime. You know, my, my, oh, yes. It well, is. you know, my, my husband likes to eat it. My husband who's Jewish, he eats it with butter and, and uh, you know, sp sprinkles garlic on it. It's delicious. Um, so, it's a vehicle. It's a yeah. vehicle something else. Um, so, you know, reading reading the book, I was reminded, I mean, speaking of, about anti-Semitism, but I was also um, reading about the the realities of of the Soviet state and um, how how closely so many things were controlled. Um, you know, we talked about the um, you know your your grandfather's art and the way artists were controlled, but also housing, right? And the and the where you know where you were assigned to live. It was there was very little freedom, it seems. And I think these are th and I'll, you write also about you know informants and how you know people could be informants and um, there was always a sense of, a, a bit of paranoia um, and I think these are things that I mean I you know being born in the 70s and growing up in the 80s when it was always you know Russia the bad guys and <laughs> hearing about <laughs> hearing about these things um, <laughs> I I guess it was always sort of well I don't know how how bad is it is it really this bad or is it and you know, reading your your book, I was reminded, gosh, yeah, th there was, things were pretty rough. But what I want, you know, what you do so beautifully is the, the whole first part of the book, which which was your voice um, as a child, um, the innocence and the joy of a child is very clear. You know, you, you have a childhood that seems generally content. I mean, not, uh, obviously, when, when yes. things happened with your mother, um, that changed things. But I'm wondering if, um, to what extent you were, well, let me back up. I'm curious to know to what extent adults at that time living in the Soviet Union during this era thought about these, these the, you know, the control of the state, the, the scarcity, saw this as being, you know, oppressive in the way that we in the U.S. would have seen it as being oppressive, or if it was just the water that they swam in, it was just life, it was just normal. I think I think I absolutely agree with you. I think you're actually absolutely right on. Is I don't think we thought about uh, life, not children, not adults, as something oppressive at all. I right. think Russia, and perhaps to the certain extent even now, Russia exists on two 
on two orbits, right? Mm. So there is an orbit of a government, there is an orbit of controlled uh, media and whatever um, whatever they say on TV or newspapers, it's almost like, uh, you, um, you know, blah, 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 blah. You don't hear any of this. You just don't turn on TV until, you know, a movie, some love, you know, romantic comedies comes on. Right, um, right. That's how I remember it. And I think that people really, so the, the people lived on a whole different orbit and it was friends, it was nature, it was camping, there was um, neighborhoods, uh, yeah. food and uh, art. Art uh, is highly regarded. Russians are extremely superstitious. So universe talks to us, you know, mm. through numbers, through new numerology, through through various signs. And horoscopes, yeah. <laughs> horoscopes, I know. Yeah. So I'm a Libra. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so it's very spiritual. Even mm. even when religion was uh, not allowed, you know, persecuted, uh, the place was still very spiritual. And I think there was mm. a lot of richness through music, art, all of those things. And sure. you no, know, I don't think until until and you wouldn't be bothered until you make a decision that did not align with the right. state. And that's what happened with my mother, right, and my grandfather, and then. Right. The whole different reality. Yes. So let's talk about that. So once once your uh, mother and grandmother um, put in the paperwork and requests to emigrate, emigrating was not something that many people did or were allowed to do. Um, and that really sent in motion a chain of events uh, where your mother ended up being um, accused of a, so your mother, your grandmother first was able to leave the country um, and she headed to Ann Arbor. Um, but your mother uh, and you <laughs> were held back for quite a long time. So tell us what happened. Well, so um, uh, what happened? A lot of things happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, so basically, one of the things happened is that I remember being in the class um, and our school teacher was telling us, uh, this was the 80s when a lot of <clears throat> Russian, um, you know, Barishnikov and the Russian actors, musicians would just uh, go, you know, towards the West and, leave, and stay. And de fact, yeah. And ask, and de fact. And so this was a conversation. And I remember the teacher at school say, uh, tell the class that, you know, these people are traitors. Mm -hmm. Everyone who wants to leave the country, our wonderful amazing, glorious uh, Soviet Union is a traitor um, mm -hmm. because strong people, the patriots, want, will stay and build the communism. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at the same time, my family was um, trying to emigrate. Right. And I was in this limbo between wanting to be a patriot and wanting to be part of the good guys. And at the same time, I wanted to be with my family. Mm -hmm. um, the so there was a, a very so even so borders were closed, but few people, Soviet Jews, were allowed um, to emigrate if they passed a series of uh, reviews, mm -hmm. and um, the reviews included. So uh, our delay started with the family, with my uh, father, right, uh, and then uh, because if there was a. Um... A, um, a blanking on the uh, he was he and your mother were not together at the time so there was a uh, child you know was he was he going to relinquish his you know official what I can't rem think of the word it starts with paternity, paternity. 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 Yeah, paternity. <laughs> right he was going to relinquish his paternity and which would allow your mother to to take you out of the country but that was yeah that was delayed yeah. Essentially, to relinqu he decided to, he decided to relinquish paternity, so he wouldn't give right. me a formal permission, right. uh, because those permissions would cause a lot of trouble. Basically, anybody who was, was associated with the traders, the people who wanted to emigrate, all thousands of us, um, right. had were uh, everybody who uh, supported uh, right. that decision were. Uh, could potentially be in a lot of troubles including um, right employers uh professors you know anyone who uh the government could look at and be like well you must have you must have put this idea in their head or you know why why weren't you doing your part to make them be patriotic and and want to stay that's right that's yeah. right and so my mother not wanting so so one of the you know one of the steps in this chain of events is she didn't want to cause 
more troubles to people she worked with. So she left her job and took a job uh, in a, what she thought was a low, uh, kind of low uh, level um, field. Uh, right. Working at a salon. <laughs> at a Cosmetica, salon. Cosmetica, right? Cosmetica. <laughs> Cosmetica. Right. Yeah. Cosmetics. Yeah. 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 But she, I mean, it seemed like the, the crime she were, was accused of, first, it seemed like there was some interpersonal kind of stuff. I was fascinated to learn you write about how the hairdressers would, um, I mean, there was a lot of, um, you know, embezzlement going on. But because, <laughs> you know, the, the hairdressers couldn't really live on the salary, the official salary. So they would be skimming off the top or taking cash tips from from patrons. But as a result, the, you know, the owners of the salon weren't able to provide the right amount to the state. So it was this really messy. And, and your mother went in trying to sort of do things right. <laughs> um, and she she really she ended up uh, getting caught for or, you know, being snitched on essentially for taking some manicure kits that had already been thrown out. And then there was a matter of a bottle of alcohol that she took. She was taking for an event. And I mean, it was, it, read the book, folks. It's like, it's kind of amazing how minor uh, the, this crimes were that ended up with her being imprisoned. Um, it was sort of astonishing, but really that was, I mean, that was all a result of the fact that she had applied to, to emigrate basically. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. So, so, so the corruption that she saw there. So she was, uh, she went, uh, she wanted to be uh, learned to cut hair so that when she comes to America, yeah. she would have a job. Uh, but uh, instead, they gave her a job as a manager of the salon. Right. Uh, and she was absolutely shocked to see the scale of uh, theft, yeah, and bribes and corruption there. The kind of scale of corruption that I think that formed in in under socialism basically preceded is a foundation of what may have maybe mm -hmm. happening in Russia today. Mm -hmm. and, um, so she did not participate in any of this. And in fact, Jane, you're right that she was trying to uh, kind of create a more honest pathway and actually take this money and you know send it where it was supposed to be, which is the government. But um, uh, the hair, hairdressers, you know, they they handled cash, and yeah. the life was difficult, and the salaries were minuscule. And yeah. uh, to be honest with you, it's just it's very tempting not to take this money. Sure, there was no computers to you know to trace. Right. <laughs> right. Just put it in your pocket. Yeah, and, you know who is to blame them? I don't know. I'm, I'm, I don't know. I don't know because the government was probably stealing from them. Of I course, so. yeah, it's natural. I mean, it it, it makes total sense. Yeah. Um, so it, the book actually, you know, we've it's it's your book primarily, but your mother actually wrote um, or you wrote together um, this whole portion in the middle, which is from her point of view. Um, and I'd love to hear you. Uh, I, I'm going to ask you to read some of that, but before uh, you do that, can you tell us a bit about how the collaboration worked? Did did she physically write it, or did you, you know, talk with her and you transcribed? How did it work? Yeah, so I started to write my own pieces uh, separately some mm -hmm. years ago, um, and then when I was ready to tell her that I want to do this book, she was uh, her first reaction is why why go back to you know, mm -hmm. uh, but. Um, then surprise, you know. Then we decided she, um, we decided to record her memories, and um, I was so surprised to see how um, she was able to give me these memories from the beginning to end in this very clear sequence, as if she was going through this narrative over and over um, yeah. ahead. I think that she never received uh, justice in yeah. Russia, so um, she was accused of a crime that she was not guilty of. Right. She had witness accounts and um, she was completely innocent. There yeah. were witnesses, there were documents to prove that she committed no crime. Right. Uh, especially against the landscape of this vast, vast corruption. Right. Um, and the reason, uh, well, there's, you have to read the book, it's more complicated, but the main reason is because she was a Jew and emigrating. Right. And so it was, um, you know, still on, unspeakable a mother a woman 
a mother yeah. of a small child. Single to, mother, yeah. To be. Um, and so um, many, so this was, a, this was um, how things were dealt uh, in, in Russia. A lot of, uh, many times, political um, dissidents were given um, criminal charges. Yeah. And it still happens today. Uh, mm. even at larger scale, but many, many dissidents uh, were, went went for you know theft or drug possession or right. or just made up uh, fabricated crimes, mm -hmm. and many of them uh, were cleared in the nineties. But uh, we were here in the United States, right. um, and so this book is uh, a way to to bring some justice yeah. uh, for my mother. And do, I got the impression that a lot of what she wrote and told you about, you didn't, you hadn't heard before, right? Like her, her experiences in the, in the prison. Some of it. Yeah. Some of yeah. it was new. Some of yeah. it. Yeah. It was difficult to come to terms, you know, to be able to bring it out. I'm sure. I'm sure. All right. I'd love to hear you. Can you read a passage um, from your mom's point of view? I'd love to hear that. Okay. So, I um, so this piece uh, is um, to set it up. So she just um, she was taken from her trial. So uh, basically, all you know <laughs> the uh, the three men came with the search. Um, mm -hmm. At that at that moment, we were um, we had our exit visa. Uh, she gave up her citizenship. Um, they came with the search, and um, there was three months of um, investigation. Uh, and all along, for this duration, three months, everybody was telling my mom not to worry, my mother not to worry, uh, that she will be acquitted uh, because there was no crime. Mm -hmm. um, she went, she left in the morning for um, her trial, and I stayed home waiting for her. Um, and she did not come back. Mm. So the piece that I want to read is from uh, her part uh, when she was brought to Christi, uh, to prison called Christie, the crosses. Um, and so this is this is her telling. Uh, Abizyanik, the monkey ta uh, tank, my first prison cell. If it were a room in a house, it could barely fit a couch and a small table. The cell uh, had wooden uh, double banks, wall to wall. It looked like white bookshelves. Two women sat on the top of one, a third at the bottom. There was an open toilet bowl, rusted and stained, cockroaches everywhere, and an unbearable smell, a pungent reek of unwashed bodies and human waste. Then the guard took me out of a monkey uh, tank and moved me to another cell. It was larger and more crowded. Uh, the banks called Shkonki, I took up most of it. The space between them was so narrow that when someone was sitting on the lower bank, bunk, um, you had to turn sideways to pass. It was dark. You could barely make out the face of another cellmate uh, on the opposite end of the cell. Dull, dim, sickly yellow light came from the single sing uh, ceiling fixture. The windows were covered with horizontal louvers, bolted from the outside and angled up to block the view of the yard. No view at all, none. You could only see strips of gray sky between the black metal slats. Um, we call them eyelashes. The story goes that the man who invented this um, eyelashes was murdered by prisoners. But inmates managed to hook strings um, on the metal slats and somehow constructed, constructed a postal pass between male and female cell blocks. They called it scribbles. The scribbles went back and forth constantly and you could hear paper gently graze against the red brick outside. Some were coded messages between crime partners, but mostly they were love letters between strangers, some quite vulgar, but <laughs> also tender and sweet. The bread they gave us felt like they, black and sour, when I tore off a piece, it congealed into black clots. I couldn't eat it. 
demon shaped it into toys, little black foxes, little black uh, bears. I looked at those things and thought, here women are making toys and their children are somewhere else without their mothers. Mm. Mm. Very powerful. Yeah, those descriptions of the um, of the prison and the the you know the labor and Gorky, it was it was quite chilling. Um, so, all right, gone to a dark place. We need to spend some time in a brighter place. So let's go to camp. <laughs> As we said, we're going to talk about camp. <laughs> so, tell, tell me about your experience. Well, I really yeah. don't talk. Yeah. Part of the reason I was so interested in this book is I, I went to the Soviet Union in 1988. It was just barely still the Soviet Union. And um, I, yeah, it was part of a peace exchange. I spent a month at Artek, which was this very fancy um, Soviet youth pioneer, young pioneers camp in uh, in Ukraine on the Black Sea. And I've, I've learned every time I've mentioned this in years hence to someone who's Russian, they're like, oh, you you went there, or someone who's Eastern European, you know, at, of any extra extractions. Oh my gosh, you went to Artek. Um, so it was a it was a very elite sort of place, but there were all there were many of these young pioneer camps. So the Young Pioneers was a Soviet youth organization, communist youth organization, um, and you were a member of this as well. And like me, you also um, went to a Young Pioneer camp. I I have to show a couple pictures so people can get a sense of the um, the the pageantry. I mean, it was very much a lot of this, um, you know, uniforms and flags and ceremonies. I've, when I went, um, you know, I felt like there was constant sort of marching and, and speeches. And, and there was also lots of normal kid stuff, too, where there was swimming and, and games and, and playing. But it was a funny combination. Um, these, you know, visages of Lenin were everywhere. This is, this is me um, in my, you know, surrounded by other campers in their in their uniforms. Anyway, um, and you may recognize this, uh, Yelena. These um, one thing that happens at camp is people trade these pins. You recognize these things? Yeah, this is a big part. So anyway, I'll stop talking about me because I'm. No, no, no I want to hear it. I want yeah. to hear. It. Okay. I mean, you know how it is. I well, what I thought was interesting about your, you know, the section in your book about the camp is you went there, yes, as Bojena says, Bojena, who's from Poland, uh, camp, another place of massive indoctrination. Absolutely. I mean, it was really, um, it was fascinating to see as an American teenager, all this stuff that was going on. And, and there were moments, we had a, a translator, and there were moments where we were at some of these big ceremonies in the in the big um, amphitheater, so, you know, Lenin looking at us, where people would be giving speeches. And our translator, who I've since can, been convinced that it was KGB, um, like sort of following, <laughs> just like there to keep an eye on us. Um, but she uh, she would translate, but then she was like, oh, mm, you probably don't want to hear, th they're talking about Vietnam or, or they're talking about Nicaragua. It, yeah, they're not, they're saying not very nice things about America. So I was like, okay, I, that's all right. Um, but anyway, uh, but you also, but you had a bit of a chip on your shoulder by the time you went to camp, right? Yes, I had. My mother was in prison and I had to participate, you know, I had to stand in those assemblies and listen to all the speeches and watch the red flag, you know, flying mm -hmm. up. And, um, it was a surreal. So I have to say the attack that you went to was uh, a kind of an amazing place, but um, it was not like any other summer right. camp in Russia. Right. And, there were very few camps that would have three, you know, one, let alone three swimming pools. And, right. Uh, I think, right. Uh, I mean, it was, I'm sure it was a wonderful place to be. And it looked like a resort, especially we were in the, the nicest of the camps. I mean, we were literally looking over, we were on the beach basically and palm trees and roses. And I mean, it really was, it was beautiful in place, and it's yeah. in Crimea, right? That is now Crimea, yeah. Back to Russia again, so right, right. Uh, but yeah, we all grew up with we all grew up with uh, kind of hearing about their tech and uh, wanting to be there. But I think by the time I was twelve, and you know everything happened, we, this was not a place to be. But the, I have to say, going back to your point that not everything was bad in Russia, is that you know there were many wonderful things and the summer camps that were you know real kids summer camps were probably closer to the one you describe in 
uh, in Eden Lake. Eden Lake. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Yeah. And the people were kind and the counselors were good and there were lots of nature and, and just a place to, you know, to rest and be, be free, really. Yeah. I mean, within the compounds of this place. And there were many other things that, and, and, and not on top of it, they were, they were almost free. Right, right. And many other things in Russia were actually quite good. So the housing was almost free and everybody had access right. to it. And it's not always the nicest. It was small, but right. everybody had access to it. Right. Uh, you know, mothers, new mothers could have going, you know, uh, going back to the other book I just read. Right, right. It means um, <laughs> <laughs> the um, seeing double, right? Is that yeah, the double, double time? Yeah. Double time. Double time. Double time. Yeah. Uh, so the, uh, yeah. So when I was, uh, when I had my kids in the United States, I had six weeks of, um, you know, maternity leave. Right. Right, you would have a whole year. Right. Right. If your kids get sick, you have unlimited, un I'm saying this again, unlimited uh, sick days to take care of your children. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So there right. were trade offs. And yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And there wasn't the kind of, um, huge disparities that that you know we have here and you would have in a you know capitalist um economy what was always interesting it's interesting the the um the scarcity though like the 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 lack of choice in 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 goods and things i mean i remember somehow sneaking off the property of our tech and finding our way to a little store and it was it was you know, half half empty shelves, and I, I thought that, that that was always a little puzzling to me. <laughs> you can go to uh, we could I can go to Whole Foods now and see. Well, some right of now, yeah, no, exactly, exactly. It's a strange yeah. time. I think that you know, I don't think we suffered. You know, I remember when I came to Ann Arbor, and the first thing people wanted to do was to show me the you know the supermarkets. You know, there was Kroger and come see the Kroger and see all the choices of cereal. And But the thing is, I don't think, I don't remember suffering from the scarcity. You get used mm. to what you have and you love it. And I actually think that in some ways, growing up in Russia was a lot easier mm. to grow up than what I see my own teenagers, you know, with all the freedom. You know, we had yeah. uniforms. The kids, my kids have to choose what to wear and what statement right. to make. And I think that, Again, my 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 childhood was different from others, but yeah. I I don't think there was as much anxiety. Right. I don't remember as much anxiety or depression or stress. Yeah. No. I I I remember there being um, being almost envious. You know, when when we went over when we went to the camp, like we all had so much crap with us. We had like so much luggage and so much stuff. And we brought all these things to trade and give, you know, gifts and everything. Um, and he, then we'd see kids with like one little bag with like three outfits and they'd wear, you know, and I, I felt, I remember feeling a little gross, kind of like, God, it's just, well, it's just, it was just, the contrast was so extreme. And it, and it did, I, I remember feeling, I, I it was a, time of real growth for me I think as a kid coming from not only coming from America but coming from you know privilege in America and you know to well off not crazy well off, but you know an upper middle class family and in a Connecticut suburb and I was like wow um I I am so in terms of like material things I am fortunate but fortunate to the to the point of it's a little gross a little you know just all anyway that's okay uh, <laughs> so it you know it certainly get perspective anytime anytime you travel but to travel yeah. such, such a different place so no you had, I think you had you had privileges but I don't think it's because of the things we have here in America right. I think you know definitely the the right to speak your mind is a is a treasure it's, right. and I hope we never lose this right you know the freedom to choose who will you know be our president but um, but I think there, is, there was, I, I think there may be advantage of having this economy of means that there was in Russia, where you don't have, you know, you don't have to have, you don't have a closet of, full of clothes, you don't have to, um, there was just less, uh, less recycling, less garbage to throw away, less, right, right, less dust to clean, less right. laundry to do, and, right, I, and I think that also for us because you know we lived in smaller places, it's for, forced us to be outside in nature, mm -hmm. really connection with nature, yeah, that, 
it was quite beautiful there. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like it. Eugene is saying another thing about, about the time, creativity. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Well, so I have a couple more questions, but if anyone in the in out there who's watching has questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and, and we'll we'll uh, give them to Yelena. And I, I was gonna ask um, when you did come to the US, how old were you at that point? Seventeen. Seventeen? Okay. So what was the what was the hardest part of about that transition for you? Nothing. Nothing. No, really? It was Nothing. easy. I because of our experience, mm. I'm grateful for uh, our very difficult experiences for mm. this one reason, that any day in the United States was better than <laughs> what I had before. Right. And, right. and so it was just every day was a blessing. Mm -hmm. I remember um, just feeling sometimes I would have this recurrent, recurring nightmare that I'm mm. trapped in a subway on in, in Leningrad and I can't breathe and I can't mm. move. And I would wake up in an arbor in our uh, refugee apartment uh, with the wall to wall carpet. And, you know, the heating system was hissing and, you know, and, mm. and just feeling so lucky. Um, mm. It was nothing. Yeah. Wow. It was all you, good. Have you been back to Russia since? I was never, I never went to Leningrad. Um, I went um, to Russia when I was working on my grandfather's painting. I went to Moscow okay. because uh, the publisher was a very good publisher there. Mm. And they we, we did the book both in Russian and in uh, English. And that's it. And it was one week in the last 35 hmm. years. And wow. um, I haven't been reading books in Russian in part because uh, I wanted my memories to be fresh. So, mm -hmm. you know, kind of read my own. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do, how much do you think has has changed since you lived there in terms of I don't know I, the the culture I mean obviously things have changed in the economy and in the government but do you think a lot of it's still the same in some ways I'm hopeful I'm hopeful I think um so I'm guessing because I have not also I have not been following Russian news so um very closely other than what I hear on NPR mm -hmm. um but I'm hopeful. I think this new generation has this very fresh view, and uh, I think they're broad-minded, and I think things will uh, turn around and get better. Mm. But mm. I think that some of the things that are happening right now with criminal system, yeah. with abuse of journalists, with uh, journalists going to prisons for made, you know, made-up crimes, yeah. are probably lingering. Are I see the parallels. I, I think that those things are built on the foundation that was put uh, right. in the Soviet times, in the, what, I, what I experienced in my family in the mm. 70s and 80s. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think there is a good future up ahead. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. We there and here. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, Yelena. And um, I want to make sure we, I think we'll put a link up to um, bookshop.org where folks can order the book. Is there anywhere, and, and is this in some of the um, local stores in the Boston area as well? Can folks find this? At yes, it should be in uh, Brookline Smith, mm -hmm. in, uh, I'm sorry, Booksmith in Brookline, Booksmith, yep. um, Porter Square Bookstore, mm -hmm. uh, Book Crack in Arlington. Great. Um, places like that. Awesome. All there. right. Jane, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to speak. Thank you. Me. Likewise. And, and I love your writing. I love it. Oh, thank writing. you. I love yours. The book was wonderful. And I hope there'll be another too. So thank you so much.